رحم الله من قرأ الفاتحة أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين خاتم النبيين شفيع المذنبين رحمة للعالمين مولانا وسيدنا أبي القاسم محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين لا سيما بقية الله في الأرض أرواحنا له الفداء ولعنة الله على أعدائه مجمعين من الآن إلى قيام يوم الدين أما بعد فقد قال أمير المؤمنين وإمام المتقين علي بن أبي طالب وعجبت لمن شك في الله وهو يرى خلق الله صلوات على محمد وعلى محمد Respected elders, brothers, sisters, salamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Tonight is our second lecture of the series in which we are discussing how to properly connect our souls to this world and the hereafter. And last night our discussion was on the famous saying of our first Imam in which he describes this world to us in the form of six points. In which he says, each of these points, I'm amazed and I wonder at the person who lives in this world but fails to understand these six things. And yesterday we managed to get through two. Today is a different discussion, but let me just finish off yesterday's discussion very briefly so that we complete the six points. The first point, if you remember, our beloved Imam had said that I am very surprised and shocked at the miser in this world. Because the way he behaves, he lives like a poor person. Someone who is a miser, he doesn't spend where money should be spent. Or it doesn't have to be money. It could be time, it could be resources, it could be his skills, it could be his abilities. But he doesn't use them where they should be used. So what happens? He lives in the world like a poor person. But in the hereafter, he'll have to give hisab as a rich person. No one should think that, well, if I'm not spending, I've got nothing to account for. No, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will actually ask. You had it, why did you not spend it? You kept your family in unreasonable conditions. How could you do that? In Islam, although we have teachings which tell us, yes, it's better to choose a simple lifestyle so that we don't get attached to the world and the worldliness. But at the same time, we have to fulfill the wajibat. The wajibat of our family, the wajibat of our children, we have to provide for them. And this is especially for men. Husbands and fathers, we have a much higher responsibility towards this thing than the women. In fact, in a marriage, in a stable relationship where husband and wife is there, Islam as a compulsion does not, does not expect from the women any of this. It is the man's duty. So it's actually a very big burden and responsibility that we have number two from the words of Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali alayhi salatu was salam Allahumma salam he says I'm surprised and I wonder at the man who has pride because if he thinks carefully yesterday he was a drop of fluid and tomorrow he's going to be a rotting corpse how can he be proud Number three, this is new now. This was until yesterday we had discussed up to here. Number three, Mawla says, وَعَجِبْتُ لِمَنْ شَكَّ فِي اللَّهِ وَهُوَ يَرَى خَلْقَ اللَّهِ I am amazed at the one who has doubt on Allah, but yet he sees all around him the creation of Allah. But just before coming here, I had a discussion with a few brothers. They said, look at this universe. We are a tiny, tiny speck 
in the whole universe. Our earth is tiny. Our solar system is minuscule. All around us there are billions of galaxies. Each galaxy has billions of stars. Each star has maybe tens of planets. Surely there must be life in other places. I said, well, there might be. We don't know. We haven't got any evidence yet. There might be. So they said, then why does Allah create this if He doesn't show us other beings? I said, you know what? Turn it the other way around. Maybe Allah wants us to look at this magnificent universe, the billions and trillions of stars and galaxies that there are, and to question ourselves that, wow, what an amazing Lord we have. That amongst all of this wonderful creation that we can see, He chose to give us life. He chose us to give His mercy. He chose us to give His guidance. So Amirul Mu'minin says, I am amazed at the person who sees the world around him, beyond the world around him, all of the different things, from the smallest atom, neutron and electron, to the biggest galaxy and star in the sky, and he doesn't have faith in God. How can it be? Number four, وَعَجِبْتُ لِمَنْ نَسِيَ الْمَوْتِ وَهُوَ يَرَى الْمَوْتَى Imam says, I'm amazed at the person. He forgets death. But he sees all around him people are dying. Which person has lived forever? No one. Death is the one thing that no one, no matter what religion or mazhab they are, they cannot deny. Amir al-Mumini says, I'm amazed that you forget your death, but you see death all around you. Number five. وَعَجِبْتُ لِمَنْ أَنْكَرَ النَّشْأَةَ الْأُخْرَى I am amazed at the person who denies that there will be a re-resurrection from the grave. But he has already seen a نَشْأَةُ الْأُولَى The first birth of a human being. Allah says in the Qur'an وَذَرَبَ لَنَا مَثَلًا وَنَسِيَ خَلْقًا A person comes to the Holy Prophet and says, how is Allah going to make these bones alive again? This is going to be our discussion, by the way. How is Allah going to raise these bones? قُلْ يُحْيِيهَا الَّذِي أَنْشَأَهَا أَوَّلَ مَرَّةِ Bro, if He can create you in the first place from nothing, then of course He can put these bones together and recreate you. The recreation is easier than the first creation. Because in the first creation, He didn't have anything. The second creation in the Akhirat, he's got something to work with. So, how can a person deny the next life when he has seen already the birth of the first life? And then sixth and final point before we go on to our next subject. And this is going to link it actually with Salawat ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Wa ajibtu. He says, I'm amazed at the person who spends so much money, effort and time building his house in this world. And he forgets to build for his house in the hereafter. Let's admit it. We spend a lot of time and energy and money looking after our worldly lives. Our house should be nice. It should be up to date. It should look good. It should have all the mod cons. It should have all the luxuries that we can afford. And we become so busy sometimes in this worldly chasing around, we forget the life hereafter. Amir al says, I'm very surprised. How can someone do this? He recognizes the importance of his worldly house he forgets the importance of his house in the Akhirat. Now, these were the six points from our Mawla Amirul Mu'mineen Ali alayhi salatu was salam. That leads us on to our discussion this evening. This evening we are discussing, this is going to be a four lecture mini series within the series. Yesterday and today we have discussed the world. 
tonight and for the next three more nights, four in total, we're going to discuss the journey of the human being from death to the final abode. So from the moment of death, what will happen? How do we understand these things? Until the end point when either we will go into heaven or hell. And inshallah we'll be going to heaven. Let's pray that that is the case. What will happen in between? How does it make sense? What can we do to put it into our lives? What practical lessons can we learn? This is our discussion this evening. Once again with Salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Some of these points we have discussed in previous years, but I'm relying on the fact that we often forget majalis very easily. So hopefully they'll be fresh for you. Some of them I repeat, but we are going to join them all in the sense that we're going to make it until the end point. So tonight is death, tomorrow barzakh, then the next two after that is qiyamat. Qiyamat part one, qiyamat part two. So there is a phenomenon <clears throat> that we come across regardless of faith, regardless of religion, regardless of God. There's a phenomenon amongst human beings. NDE, near death experience. NDE. There have been books written on this. There have been case studies on this. There have been sociologists who have gone and interviewed people, anyone who has experienced NDE, they have interviewed them, they've gathered all the details. And we see a very similar picture coming through. Again, let me stress again. This is any culture, any religion, any time. We see very similar reports of what happens when someone experiences maybe an accident or a heart attack or something like that. They get near to death, but they don't die. What happens? Number one, they say we saw ourselves emerge from our own bodies and we went up and we could see everything happening below. We could see, for example, ambulance, doctors, nurses. We could see our parents. We could see our loved ones. We could see our friends. We could see our families. We could see the hospital machines. We could see all the wires and tubes. Number two, we were in not our bodies because we could see that down there, but we had a new kind of body around us. Different body. It behaved differently. It had the features of a body, but not that body which we left behind that we could see down below. It was a different kind of body. Number three, this is very interesting. While we were looking down to our bodies, we lost all sense of time. We weren't stressed, we weren't really worried. We were kind of confused, but at the same time we were very relaxed. It was a state of relaxation. Number four, very interesting. Now, I wonder if any of you have been at the side of a deceased loved one, a marhum. If you've been at the side of a marhum, I have, this has happened to me in my family. What happened was, when my grandmother passed away a few years ago, and I was there for the last moments, she would say, who are these people? And I would say, who? There's no one here, it's just us. She would say, no, look, they are there. They're calling me. And I didn't understand at that time. I put it down to confusion or whatever. But in the NDE experiences, we saw the souls of other dead people calling us and welcoming us. And we have actually a hadith in this regard. Whoever dies will see me. Who said that? Amirul Mu'mineen alayhi salam. Whoever dies, yarani, will see me. 
Now, was it Imam Ali for my grandmother? Can't say for sure. But this is his hadith, that when a mu'min dies, he will or she will see me. I hope it was. Now, a lot of this is in tune and it corroborates with Islamic understanding. Now, do we have teachings about the hereafter? Many people think, no, it's a mystery. We don't know what's going to happen. Many religions say, we don't know. We don't have details about the hereafter. Let me tell you, Islam as a religion has a lot of details. They're not obvious. Many things that I'm going to quote to you in the next four nights are going to be from the Holy Quran. We read it all the time, but we have never noticed these things. They're very subtle. Then when you get the Holy Quran and you look at that reference and you match it to Hadith of Masumin, then it makes sense. So we have a lot of teachings about this. But at the end of the day, there could be more to it. Of course there is more to it. We don't have been given all the details. So when we come to, for example, the day of Qiyamat and we discuss the stations, well, we've been told there are 40 stations. But we only know a handful. We only know about 10. We haven't got the details of the other 30. Either those hadith have been lost or the Masumin did not want to give us the full picture. Maybe they said, no, this amount is enough. We don't want to reveal everything. We don't know. But we have sufficient to be able to build a picture about this. Now, death. <clears throat> what is the opposite of death? Can someone tell me? Life? Sorry, you're wrong. That was a trick question. Opposite of death is birth. Opposite of death is birth. So what is opposite of life? Death, opposite is birth. So what is the opposite of life? opposite of life is non-life it doesn't actually have an exact opposite it doesn't have an exact opposite so what do we understand by this what we understand is once you are alive once you are created by God you're never going to die actual real death which means annihilation never happens so from this moment on no not from this moment from before your birth, when Allah created your soul, pre this world, before this world was created, from that moment, forevermore, you are not going to die. So when we say death, we don't mean perishing. We don't mean annihilation. We don't mean destruction. Death for a mu'min is simply a doorway into a better world. So now let's discuss another point, a better world. Why do we say better world? Well, dunya, this place is called dunya, right? What does dunya mean? Does anyone know the actual meaning of the Arabic word dunya? Low. Low, but actually to be more accurate, lowest. Lowest. For example, it's the feminine version of adna. Let me explain that. So in Arabic, we have masculine, feminine, asghar, lower or smaller, sughra, female version, akbar, greater, kubra, female, greater. Yeah? Dunya is lowest in terms of the hierarchy of the worlds, the three different worlds. This is the lowest. For a Mormon, this place honestly it has not much value he doesn't regard it as very important for itself he sees it as a stepping stone to something better he sees it as the lowest form of existence but it sometimes it becomes difficult for us to realize this it's like the baby in the womb the way they explain death in this world to the next world is like the baby in the womb the baby in the womb is very comfortable it thinks this is my whole world it thinks this is how the world is it doesn't know any different 
it's happy, it's content, it gets its nutrition, it gets whatever it needs, it's growing, it doesn't know what's going to happen next, all of a sudden it comes out into a wonderful, massive, huge, complicated place. They say that going from this world to the next world is even more shocking than this. And we will think, oh my God, where were we? That place was rubbish. Why did we spend so much time and effort on that place? That was worthless. It was a waste of time. So death is a portal or a doorway to a better and higher level of existence. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. You ask a doctor, do we have doctors in the room? Must have some. Inshallah, you will not be needed tonight. Ask a doctor, what is the definition of death in medical science? The definition of death is, I guess, when the blood flow stops and the person loses life and they're dead. That's the medical definition. In Islam, no. In Islam, way, the way we de define death is when the soul and the body which are connected when they become disconnected or they become decoupled or they become separated so it's the decoupling of the body and soul and this happens with the help of the angel of death the angel of death his main role is to facilitate the decoupling of body and soul okay now why then is it that some people will have an excruciatingly painful death and some people will have an exhilarating exciting death why is it when some people die it'll be like just breathing they breathe out and the soul has gone and they feel free and for other people it will be the most painful most tormenting traumatic experience well this is because the one who goes through the trauma and the pain he doesn't want to leave this world he is too invested he's got his claws in th into this world he loves his life he loves for example the money he loves for example the lustful pleasures he loves all of the different material things in this world he hasn't ever thought about the life hereafter he never spent time thinking about his death so he is stubbornly holding on to this world so when the angel of death malikul maut comes to separate him from his body the body is stubborn and saying no and malikul maut is pulling and the body is resisting and he's pulling and he's resisting so there's a trauma and the person who is grounded too much in this world and he had too much love for this world will find it very difficult to let go. So then in the end it happens in a very violent because there's no other way. How do you take something from someone if they are going to be stubbornly holding on? It has to be violent. Then Malikul Moth will have to be a bit violent and hard. So remember one thing, the manner of your death will be the manner of your life the way you have lived is the way you will die if you have lived in a way where you don't have attachments and materialisms your death inshallah is going to be very very easy but if you have lived in a way where all you can think about is this world my friends my reputation my power my selfishness, my gadgets, my technologies, my luxuries, my lifestyle, my bank balance, then it's going to be very difficult. Because you need to decouple, you need to sever the link. Now what happens is, there are two very distinct experiences which I want to mention. One has been described by Imam Jafar as Sadiq alayhi salam. Imam says one day when Nabi Ibrahim returned to his home he saw someone waiting there for him this person looked amazing beautiful fragrant wonderful he looked amazing 
Imam said, who are you? He said, I am the angel of death. Imam said, Subhanallah, how can someone dislike you? You are so beautiful, you are so radiant. He says, O oh friend of the All Merciful, Ya Khalil Ar Rahman, O oh Khalil of Allah. When God desires goodness for an individual, He sends me in this form. But when He desires to punish him, He sends me in a different form. So even we will see the angel of death differently based on our life. Either it will be merciful and tender or harsh and rough. Another point I want to make. Do we experience death in this life before we actually die? Can you think of any time that we actually experience death anyway? What do you think? Is there a time? During sleep. During sleep is actually a taste, a small taste of death. Why? What happens when you sleep? Your body is unconscious. Your mind is unconscious. Okay? Then you start to dream. What happens when you dream? Do you, do, have you noticed how the dreams are very weird? Very strange. One moment you're in Bandra. Next moment you could be someone else. Next moment you could be somewhere else. Next moment you've gone around the whole world. You may travel to the moon or to Mars or to the past or to the future. You see all these weird, wonderful things. How long have you been asleep? One hour. But how much have you seen in your sleep? Maybe three or four days. Maybe a week. Maybe a year. That, what we believe, and I know the psychologists, they say no, it's a filtering and processing of information. It may be that as well, partly. But what we believe in Islam is that no, actually during those moments, your soul has left your body and has a glimpse of barzakh. Because time doesn't make sense when you're in a dream. Space doesn't make sense when you're in a dream. You see past, you see future, you see all sorts of things. So what we believe is that every night when we dream, our soul actually leaves the body, but it's just the cord, the string has not been cut. Allah allows by the morning for the soul to go back. And he says in the Quran, and some souls we take, and some we, some we allow back. So these are all signs. These are all things for us to bear in mind. Now this is why one of the things which if you're very lucky and if you're very pure in heart you can see some special dreams. Some mu'mineen they learn more and they benefit more in a few hours of sleep than they do in a long day. Because if Allah wants and He can send some special messages to you during your dream in Barzakh, then it's very special. He can give you some visions. He can show you some Imams. He can show you some Marhumin. He can show you some Ulama. I know personally people who have had conversations with Imams in their dreams. And Imams have given them advice. How is this possible? Why doesn't it happen to me and you? Well, I don't know about you, but it doesn't happen to me. Why? Well, maybe our minds are not clear enough. Maybe our hearts are not clean enough. Maybe our sins are bothering us. Maybe we need to ask for mercy of God and forgiveness of God. But dreams are very special. And if you are lucky enough to have one of these dreams, then I would say, MashaAllah, you are very, very fortunate. We pray to Allah to give us these kinds of dreams, to give us these sights of the Ma'asumeen, and for us to, you know, be able to converse with them. What a ni'mat it would be. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Walau tara idh yatawaffa alladheena kafaru al-malaika yadhribuna wujuhahum. Quran says, if you could only see when the angels come to take the souls of the faithless, if you could only see when the angels come to take the souls of the faithless, how they strike their faces and their backs. 
saying to them, Dhuku Adab al Harik, taste the punishment of the burning fire. Very different experiences. Depending on how you live, that's how you will die. So, once this severance has taken place, the body and the soul are now separated, either nicely or violently. Now the separation has taken place. What happens next? Well, the first thing that happens is that the soul is inserted into a new body. Old body is dead, the new body is activated. The new body is what we will call Barzakhi body. Barzakhi body. Barzakhi body resembles your old body in a few different things. Number one, the color, the size, some of the features. But it is different in many ways. It is more flexible, travels quickly, behaves a bit differently. Now, what happens? How will we know how to get used to this body? Well, when we were born in this world, our parents generally, they taught us. They held our hand. They encouraged us to walk. They made us crawl. They made us do certain things. Slowly, slowly, we got used to this body and we are now able to function. So who will train us in the life hereafter? Who is going to teach us? Our parents are not going to be there. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Who is going to teach us this new body? This will be other angels which Allah sends. He will send more angels to teach this person how to use the new body. Now what happens? Well, this is going to result in three distinct groups. In the Barzakhi world, we'll be in three groups. Number one, first of all, I'm going to discuss the middle group, the average group. These people is going to be the vast majority of people are going to be in this group. They have some awareness of the hereafter. They have some acceptance of the hereafter. But they are still confused. Because although they were expecting death, they knew death was coming, they are not 100% ready. So now it will take a long time for them to get used to their new body, for them to get educated by the angels, and some of them will resist. Here we need to make an important comment. What if you resist too much? What if you still have attachment to your worldly life and your worldly body? And the angels are teaching you, but like a stubborn child, you are resisting. Some people will tell the angels, get lost. Go away. Leave me alone. I'm not dead. I'm still that body. I haven't come into Barzakh. I don't know who you are. I don't know what you're saying. What will the angels do? <coughs> angels will say, Khuda Hafiz. Allah, we tried. He's not listening. How much can we try? We're leaving him. Bye. The angels will leave. How much will they do? Now, that person is going to struggle a lot because he has refused the guidance of angels. Let me draw a parallel. What is the char characteristic of a person in this world who in the life hereafter will refuse the advice of angels? What is the characteristic in this world? In the hereafter, he's telling angels, get lost. What does he do in this world? When people try to advise him or her, Amra bil maruf, nahiyan al munkar, he says, get lost. Who are you to tell me? Who do you think you are? I'm not interested. Go away. The same characteristics will transfer over there. Here, he was not willing to accept. Here, someone wanted good for him, he was not willing to accept. There, they want good for him, he's not willing to accept. Believe me, our deep-rooted issues and our characteristics are going to transfer with us. Don't think that in the life hereafter we are a new person and everything is from scratch. No. Scratch is when you're born here. That's when it's from scratch. There it's not from scratch. There you are taking your baggage and your issues with you. So, some people will struggle. They will tell the angels to go away. 
صلوات على محمد وال محمد but those who were habituated in receiving good advice in taking good advice in listening to people reflecting upon themselves understanding that i am not perfect i need to work on myself you know one of the very good things which our teachers used to say to us in hauza they used to say to us when someone criticizes you they have given you a gift when someone tells you something you are doing wrong they're giving you a gift there's a hadith of even rasulullah from imam sadiq alayhi salam ahabbu ikhwani ilayya man ahda ayubi ilayya my most beloved of friends is one who presents to me my faults as a gift my most beloved are one who presents my faults to me as a gift so these people were like this in fact they may have even asked people brother what do you think tell me am i okay do you see anything in me that i can improve why not let's have humility let's ask one another we are not looking for faults in anyone we don't want to spy on anyone we don't want to judge anyone that's not what we're saying but at least on yourself you should be spying on yourself you should have a lot of awareness that what am i like what am i doing am i doing the right thing when i speak do i come across as rude tell me when i'm people am i okay with them tell me you know this is one of the uh, acts that we must do that's the first group the middle group the second group are the pure individuals maybe we can call them awliya maybe we can call them ashabul yameen maybe we can call them muqarrabun all of these are different quranic terminologies for this excellent group the pure individuals not only masumin and others as well these are people what did they do in their life they emptied their life of pride conceit self love self importance they removed all of the selfishness from themselves but they filled themselves with what love of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala love of ahlul bayt love of quran maulana yesterday was saying three things get closer to allah get closer to rasulullah and ahlul bayt get closer to quran this is what they were busy with this is what they were using their life for so these are the pure individuals the topmost group look at this from rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wa alihi wasallam ان ملك الموت لا يقف من المؤمن عند موته موقف العبد الذليل i told you about nabi ibrahim i told you about what the quran said now look at this hadith rasulullah says that when a mu'min dies and malikul maut comes to him to take his soul malikul maut just doesn't come he sits on the floor like a lowly servant in front of this mu'min he treats the mu'min like something big like something amazing He's humble before this mu'min, Malikul Maut, sent by Allah. He has every right just to come and take the soul. No, he sits in respect of the mu'min and then he takes the soul. So these people, they're given heavenly drinks, rewards, comfort. They react very nicely to the angels. They love the angels. They appreciate the angels and they quickly activate their barzakhi body. Why do they quickly activate the barzakhi body? Because in this world for some people Allah make us one of these people really. For some people they are already one foot in barzakh in the sense that they have an awareness. They already have some realizations. They already have some understandings. Maybe Allah shows them in a dream. Maybe he shows them in a vision. maybe he shows them through angels 
Maybe he shows them through inspiration of the mind and the heart. But they are already partially activated in Barzakh. For example, one thing I read, really when I read this, it sent shivers down my spine. Allah bless our ulama. Allah bless our maraji. Allah bless our Hawza Ilmiya Qum and Najaf. Allah bless all the efforts of these wonderful people. Ayatullah Behjat. Ayatullah Behjat in his younger years. What did he do? One time with his teacher, he asked a question. He said, Agha, tell me one thing. If a person leaves this world for a few days, goes to Barzakh, and comes back to the body, does he have to pray his qaza or not? And the ulama that have narrated this and knew Agha Bahjat, they have said, this is most likely because he had this experience. Most likely he's asking about himself. He obviously is not going to say it, but most likely he's asking that when I leave this world and I go into Barzakh for a while and I come back, do I have to pray my Qaza or not? This was in his younger days as a student. So some people are already partially there. Then we have the third group, the corrupt individuals. Oh Allah, we don't want to be amongst this group. They are the souls which were polluted. They are full of vice evil bad habits they defied god they were rebellious to god they didn't want to submit allah said submit they said no some people you know they have this comment i will become a good muslim i will start to pray i will start to wear hijab when i get the feeling when allah gives me a feeling I will start. Baba, where is this feeling coming from? Tell me. I want one as well. What feeling? Where have you ever read? Where does the Quran say that wait for a feeling and then start to pray? What feeling? Which Imam has said that wait for a feeling? Or what if the feeling has come and gone and you didn't realize because you're so full of sin? What if you die before this feeling comes? There's so many ridiculous things about this that really I feel a bit embarrassed to even say it. But this should not be the case. We should not be using these kinds of statements. This is very immature, very childish way of looking at religion to say that when the feeling comes, I will start. Some people, they say, for example, after Hajj, I will start doing this. It's not acceptable. It's not what our religion says. Imagine tomorrow our Imam, Imam Zamana, Ajalallahu Ta'ala, Farajo Sharif. He comes and he says, tell me, what did you do in your life for me? And you say, Mola, I was waiting for a feeling. What's he going to say? It's very, very ridiculous thing to say. Inshallah, none of us say this kind of thing. The feeling is actually always in front of us. Quran, Ahlul Bayt. We can't have any other feeling than this. Obvious things in front of us, black and white. It's there. Let's read it and follow it. So corrupt individuals, defying God, oppressing other people, what happens to them? Well, number one, they hate death. Number two, they hate the angel of death. Number three, they hate the other angels. Number four, this is the sad part. They hate all of these things. Guess what? The angels hate them. The way they don't want to be in the presence of angels, the angels don't want to be in their presence either because they are full of vice and rebellion against God. Which angel is going to accept this? For the angel, this is the most disgusting thing. So the angels hate them. For them, their death is the greatest fear and they have intense remorse and regret. Rasulullah has said, Sallallahu Alaihi wa Alaihi Wasallam, For this third group of people who are the corrupt, every moment of the process of dying will be as agonizing as 100 strikes of a sword. 
So for them, death is not going to be a nice experience. They will see death as bad and it will be bad because they haven't prepared. And they are stubbornly attached to this world and they are carrying with them too many vices and evils. This is why I'm saying let's pray we are not in this third group, inshallah. So they cannot understand the angels. They do not understand this new world which they are in. Everything despises them. They want to quickly return to the world. They say, return us. Let us go back. They're told, no way. There's no way back. The door is closed. Then what happens? Then after a while, this third group of people, they then realize, actually, look at us. We are horrible. Now we see the filth and dirt. And then they become nauseated at their own selves. That's when it realizes then the penny drops. And they say, you know what? Now we understand how bad we actually are. The holy personalities appear. He doesn't want to be in their presence. Angels come. They merely distress him or her further. Then there will be two regrets. Huge, huge regrets for this third group of people. Number one, he will say, why oh why did I not repent? Why did I not repent? I had time, I could have, I didn't. Why did I leave my qaza namazes? I had time, I could have prayed them, I didn't. Number two, the second regret. Why did I not give more charity in the way of God? I had time, I had means, I had the resources I could have given. Quran says, Wa anfiku mimma razaqnaakum min qabli an ya'atiya ahadakumul maut. Surah Munafiqun. Spend from what we have given you before death comes to you. Fayakul Rabbi Lawla akhartani. At that point you will say, Oh Lord, give us a little bit more time. That I may give some sadaqah. And I may be of those who do good. Allah replies, We will never ever give a soul a moment more once the time has come for its death. That will be a big regret. He realizes his life is done in this world. The folder is closed. No more can be written. And now he is at the mercy of his A'mal. And that's the only thing he has is his deeds. Now tomorrow, inshallah, we're going to pick it up from here at this point. We're going to discuss Barzakh in a bit more detail. This was death. Barzakh is next. That will be very, very fascinating, inshallah. And then what happens after Barzakh in the next two nights? Death, uh, sorry, not death, Qiyamat. And then the further stages of Qiyamat. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Assalamu alayka ya Aba Abdullah. Assalamu alayka ya Abna Amir al Mu'mineen. Assalamu alayka ya Abna Fatima al Zahra. We are here in these nights to commemorate the martyrdom of our beloved third Imam. Imam lived in Medina. And some people after the death of Rasulullah, they would come to Medina. And they would say, if only we had come when the Prophet was alive. We would have loved to see the Prophet. How was he? How did he look? How did he speak? How did he walk? How did he do everything? You know what they were told? They were told, don't worry. You didn't see the Prophet, don't worry. Go to this place, wait outside. When a young man comes from his house, you will see that he looks exactly like Rasulullah. His speech is like Rasulullah. His walking and talking is like Rasulullah. They said, who? 
is they said his name is Ali Yunil Akbar. He is the son of Hussein. Hussein is the grandson of Rasulullah. You want to see the copy of Rasulullah? Look at Ali Yunil Akbar. People loved Ahlul Bayt in Medina. People on the day when Imam Hussein leaves Medina are crying, Umm Salma. She says that on the day when Hussein left Medina, it was like the day that the Holy Prophet had died. People were lamenting. They could not bear to see the last member of the Panjatan, the Ahlul Kisa, is leaving and we are not maybe going to see him again. The time comes, Imam leaves Medina. He reaches Makkah. In Makkah, he is bombarded by the letters of the people of Kufa. They write to him, Imam, we need you, we want you, come to Kufa, we are ready for you. Imam sends his cousin, well, we say cousin, Imam used to say he is my brother, Muslim ibn Aqil. Imam sends Muslim ibn Aqil to Kufa. Imam then takes the journey from Makkah towards Kufa. Imam's intention was to go to Kufa. Many people say, why did Imam Hussein go to Karbala? No, he remember. Although he knew he was going to Karbala, his intention was Kufa. He was forced into Karbala. They reach a point in which they meet the forces of Hur. Hur at that time had been sent by Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad, ibn Marjana, one of the worst people of history, one of the most accursed people of history. He sends Hur, he says, intercept Hussein. Do not let him come to Kufa, force him into Karbala. Imam Hussein has a small skirmish with the forces of Hur. When that is finished, when it is solved, Imam does something amazing. I don't know how we can ever appreciate what our Imam was. He says, O oh forces of Hur, you look tired, you look thirsty. You look worn out. Come, drink our water. Some people in Imam's camp said, Oh Imam, we don't have much. How can we give it to them? He said, No, give them. The army of Hur drank. No, even the animals of Hur's army drank from the water of Imam Hussein. Imam is taken into Karbala. He reaches Karbala, second of Muharram. Imam sets foot into Karbala. Immediately, Janabi Umm Kulthum, the sister of Imam, she comes to Hussein. She says, Oh, Aba Abdullah, I don't know why, but since stepping foot onto this place, my heart is aggrieved. I feel sadness coming over me. Imam brings some people from the surrounding area. He says, tell me, what is this place? One person says, this is Qaziriya. He said, no, another name. One person says, this is Nainawa. No, another name. One person says, this is Shattul Furat. He says, no, bring one of your elders. They know the name of this place. The elder came, he said, what is the name of this place? He said, Imam, all of these are names of this place, but we have one more name of this place. This place is known as Karbin wa Bala'in, the place of sorrow and difficulty. Imam says, this is our place. Here we will offload our things. Here we will put our tents. Here we will make our camp. Imam, is settling in this place called Karbala. Imam, what does he do next? Look at the akhlaq of this wonderful man of Allah. He says, who owns this land? They say the tribe owns this land. They are called the Bani Asad tribe. He says, bring them. They come. He says, I want to purchase this land from you. They say, no, Rebna Rasulullah, we will give it to you. You are the grandson of the Holy Prophet. We will give you. He said, no, I will pay you the price of this land. He pays them. He purchases the land. Then he says, now I'm giving the land back. They say, why? He says, because I want three things from you. Number one, on the day of Ashura, you will see that we will be killed here. I want you to do me one favor. There will be no one to bury us. You will, I want you to dig some graves and bury me and my children here. 
They said, Imam, what next? He said, number two, do not use the land for any kind of farming or irrigation. They said, Imam, what's number three? He says, number three is very special. Listen to this. Oh, lovers of Imam Hussein, may Imam call us to Karbala again and again. He says, the third thing I want from you is that in the future, my lovers and my Shias will come here to visit my grave. I want you to welcome them. I want you to feed them. I want you to give them water. I want you to host them in a nice way. Ya Ibn Rasulillah, we say to you, you yourself are not going to have water. You are not going to have any place to stay. And you are worrying about your Shias. When we come there, look at Imam Hussein, look at his kindness upon us. This place Karbala is very special. This place Karbala is very blessed. It is not only Imam who has gone there. Some of the prophets have gone there before even the Holy Prophet was in this world. They visited Karbala. They looked at Karbala. All of them, they felt a sadness. And they would ask Allah, what is the sadness of this place? Allah said, this is going to be the place where the grandson of my most beloved will be killed. They all performed a salam of Imam Hussein there. But that is not the only thing. There is one more person who came to Karbala. But not during her lifetime. After she died, there is one lady, the mother of Hussein. She was in Karbala. We have a number of very amazing reports regarding Janabi Fatima. I will say one and then we will finish. On the night of Ashura, after Imam has done all the discussions, after he's given everyone the chance to go away from him, he and a few others, they leave the tents. Imam says, come with me. I will show you where each of you are going to be killed. You, Muslim, you will be killed here. You, you will be killed here. Habib, this is your place of martyrdom. Abbas, this is where you will fall. Ali Yunil Akbar, this is your place. They say, Imam, tell us where are you going to fall? When he takes them there, on the way there, they hear a sound. They hear the sound of a woman crying. The woman is crying and wailing. Imam, they say to Imam, why is there a lady in the desert? Imam says, this is no lady. This is my mother Fatima. She is crying over the place where I am going to fall. When they reach there, they see that area has been cleaned. The area doesn't have any stones. It has been wiped clean. They say, Imam, this looks different. He says, she has prepared this area for me. When I fall from Zuljana, she has cleaned this place. Allah, 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 Wa sayyalamu alladheena zalamu, ayya mun qalibin yan qalibun. Oh Allah, accept our azadari. Oh Allah, bless our marhumeen. Oh Allah, hasten the reappearance of our 12th Imam. Oh Allah, give us the tawfiq to be in his army when he comes. Let us remember all our marhumin, rahimallahu man kara al-fatiha.